You're the only one I want to cling to You're the first thought on my mind Let our voices rise All creation cries Singing out in endless Hallelujah From this moment on Join with heaven's song
Sunday. Just a reminder to all of you, if you purchase flowers, you can come up and grab them after the service, and thank you so much. They are beautiful, and they remind us of the new life that we have in Jesus Christ. We serve a risen Savior. Let, us, let this worship service be a time of celebration. The tomb is empty. He is not there, and we can take this message and carry it throughout not only the rest of this week, but the rest of our lives, though, because though we are wholly undeserving, this good news is ours forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful because today you have risen from the grave. We can visit the tomb and see that it is empty. You are not there. There is no grave that can hold you down, Lord. You told the devil no. I will not be held by death, Lord, and because of this, we know that neither will we. Lord, we know that your rising has been such a gift to us. Lord, while we were sinners, while we were undeserving, you took that pain on the cross, the pain of Good Friday, and you rose for the joy and celebration of Easter Sunday. Lord, we are so grateful. Lord, we know that you carry our cares and our burdens, and we lift them to you. May we take this time to celebrate you in all that we do. May this service just be music to your ears, Lord God. And we pray this in your holy and your heavenly name. Amen. Amen. He is risen. Amen.
Do we completely understand the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? Let that soak in. Yes, we're here to celebrate and glorify our risen Savior. Amen. But do we truly understand? This morning we're going to be in Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, what a glorious day this is, as we worship a risen Savior. Lord, I pray that the words that are spoken today from your word will bring light into our life, into our hearts. Lord, we look for your guidance as we open up your truth this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we have the reading of God's word this morning. Luke 18, verses 31 through 34. Jesus took the twelve aside and he told them, We're going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will hand, be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. On the third day he will rise again. The disciples do not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. You may be seated this morning. And it is, what a wonderful day, Resurrection Sunday. Around the world, Christians are celebrating Jesus, the Son of God, King of kings, Lord of lords. He has risen. Amen? We serve a risen Lord and Savior. And we look forward to the day when we will... Uh, stand with him in this glorious heavenly home which he has prepared for all who love and serve him. Now, the cross is the very heart of the gospel message. That's why Jesus took his disciples aside and he said these words in Luke 18, verses 31 through 33. Highlight them. Do not forget them because it's vital to your relationship and journey in your Christian faith. Do you understand these words we just read? You can say, yes, I understand them. Amen. Amen. They're simple words, right? We understand very well what Jesus was saying. 
very clear, very understandable, you would think. This is not the first time that Jesus had shared these words, but over and over again throughout the, the Gospels. Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 20. Jesus spoke these words just as clearly as he did in Luke chapter 18. These words from Jesus are right, right after Peter opens the declaration uh, to those around him that he was following Jesus in verse 28 of the same chapter, Luke 18. We have left all we had to follow you, Jesus. The disciples paid a high, a high price leaving their homes, their, their jobs to follow Jesus. And they began to pay the price of following Jesus. And they were sure they made the right decision. However, they had not come to terms with this possible broken dreams that they had floating around in their minds. Or they thought, uh, because they couldn't see themselves in the kingdom of God without Jesus. In verse 31 of our text, Jesus pulled the 12 disciples aside and he wanted them to grasp the significance of his coming death and resurrection. And it was through these two shocking, astonishing events that Jesus Christ would save the world. Amen? And his disciples had to be indoctrined. They had to be taught the glorious truth of these two facts. These two events that were to take place in history. In verses 32 and 33, as you look at your scriptures, you can see that it, it's hard to imagine that Jesus, who was speaking plainly, he tells them of his coming suffering in detail. He describes exactly what's about to happen. Jesus knew that they needed more instruction about the work that he would accomplish through his death and resurrection. When they confessed Jesus Christ, I don't believe they truly understood what it all meant. Now listen to me, believers. Attention. Let me have your attention just for a few seconds. The Christian life is not a paved road to wealth and ease. It often involves hard work, persecution, deprivation, and suffering. But the disciples, their thoughts didn't run that way. They didn't see it that way. And when you're not expecting something, it doesn't matter how clearly you were told about it. Hear me. Because at times, we hear what we want to hear, right? We hear the word of God to a certain point. Oh, I love that. I love that scripture. But we don't read the rest. The disciples were preparing to see Jesus crowned king. They could not comprehend that the only crown he was to have would be one of thorns. They didn't envision that. The Jews were the ones who were to deliver Jesus over to the Gentiles. And both the religious and the world were to reject and put God's son to death. And neither group could accept Jesus and his message of total self-denial. Have we? A few years back, I received an email message that was entitled, Things I Really Don't Understand. And it listed some questions which I want to ask you as well, which there seems to be no clear-cut answer. And some of the questions were these. Why do doctors and lawyers call what they do a practice? Now, that's scary, right? Now, why is the word abbreviation such a long word? Why is it when you're, and I'm guilty of this, why is it that when you're searching for an address while driving, you turn down the volume on the radio. Do you do that? Come on, guys. Sheila, I guess I'm the only one. Okay, there you go. And then why is a boxing ring square? And how do they get the deer to cross the highway at those designated yellow deer crossing signs? That's always baffled me. These questions 
represent a funny reminder that there are many things in this life that we, you know what, we just really don't understand. And such was the case with the disciples. Look at verse 34 if you have it before you. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them. And they didn't know what he was talking about. Now, this was a very interesting verse in Scripture. Why didn't they get it? Maybe because what they hoped to gain by following Christ was extremely different than what Jesus was describing. I mean, joining him in, in his glory was one thing, but following him to the cross, his death, well, that was another. As it is for Christians today, hear me, believers, do we truly understand, do we truly understand what following Christ means as Jesus describes it? Who, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. Do we truly understand? Here's the food for thought. Ponder this for a little bit. If great persecution came against Christians in America because of their unwillingness to join the world in their tolerance of sin, are you prepared to give up all you have for the sake of Christ, even your life? Look at verse 31. Jesus starts what we can call with a brain teaser. And he tells his disciples, we're going up to Jerusalem so all the, prophets can be, uh, the prophecies can be fulfilled. And when the disciples hear this, you know what? They're excited. This is great. You know why? Because they know the prophecies. The Messiah is going to uh, take up the sword, ride in on a horse, rally the people around him, toss out the wretched Roman government, and establish an everlasting kingdom right there in Jerusalem today. We're all in, Jesus. We're with you all the way. Jesus doesn't let those words sit long before he hits them with a ton of bricks. I'm going to be arrested and executed. The disciples probably did not recall those prophecies. And what happens then? Confusion begins to creep in. Jesus did not let that disappointment sit very long as well because he lifts them up with hope. He, he continues to tell them, but don't worry, I'll be back. I will not stay dead. I will rise from the grave. And as we read this text in Luke 18, we wonder, why didn't they understand? Why didn't they get it? With just his words, Jesus cannot help them understand. At best, his words can only, only give the disciples something to remember and to put in perspective later, a time after his crucifixion and his resurrection. Jesus' destiny in Jerusalem was simply beyond their understanding because they saw all the good that he had done. And they, uh, they had experienced this life-changing presence firsthand in their life. They believed him to be the Messiah. Now, how could the Messiah be crucified? How is that even possible? How could he be put to death for his ministry, for his words of truth, for all his miracles, the, all the good that he was doing? We, on the other hand, must step back and we must meditate on this truth this morning. Jesus is going to Jerusalem knowing full well that he will be persecuted, rejected, tortured, and put to death. He knows this. Yet he goes anyway. Why? To honor God. To pay the price for our sins. We must not let this sacrificial love, this amazing love, be hidden from our hearts. If you hear anything this morning, hear this. 
until we understand the depths of our sin before a holy God, we will not understand the cross. Until we understand the depths of our sin before a holy God, we will not understand the cross. Jesus had been clear throughout his journey to Jerusalem that it was not going to end the way the, the followers imagined. It was going to happen another way. Because you have to understand the Jewish messianic expectation, it was embedded in all of their lives to look for a conquering hero who would drive out an earthly government and all the pagans who would establish God's um, reign from Jerusalem over the entire world and create the age to come. So it was next to impossible for the disciples to fathom how Jesus' suffering, being rejected, even put to death, could possibly fit in the Jewish mindset. They couldn't comprehend this. To the point where the disciples must have been thinking, Jesus must have meant something else because he's just not making sense to us. You know what, guys, let's just continue marching into Jerusalem and enforcing God's judgment upon the Romans and set up his kingdom. Yet as plainly as he could, Jesus tells them what was to come, that he would be turned over to the Gentiles. He would be mocked, insulted, humiliated, spat upon, flogged, and eventually killed. But he would rise again on the third day. The disciples understood Jesus claiming to be the Messiah. That they accepted. They couldn't even understand someone speaking of the fact that they could understand, you know what, Jesus, I can understand that you're, you could be rejected. There's a possibility of death because we're setting up a new kingdom. But to take part in the future resurrection, they just couldn't combine all of this. But they simply could not imagine how these two events could be in their life, in the present. How could the meaning of this be hidden from them? How could they not understand such a clear statement made by Jesus? So how do we reconcile these questions? How do we reconcile them this morning in our own lives? Would it be accurate to say we all realize that there are some things that we learn later on in life? That as we look back, that we're amazed that we didn't learn it sooner. We all reach a stage in our life when we look back and see all the dumb things that we have maybe said or done or didn't understand. And we were somehow, we had known then what we know now. I know those minds have crossed every human being. How much better life could have been if we had just learned and understood those lessons early in our life. You know, often we seem unwilling to grasp and apply truths we know that are essential for our lives. But despite all we hear, we often make unwise and very foolish decisions in our life, right? What we believe, what we want to believe, We want so bad to be things the way we want them to be. And resist the truth if it does not fit into our preconceived notions. Have you ever been there? This happened to the disciples in Luke 18. Wait, this isn't the way it's supposed to happen, Jesus. This truth we just can't accept. You know what? It happens to Christians today. My parents probably wonder why I didn't learn from their mistakes or trust in their wisdom and truth. I'm sure that they felt that. If I'm honest, 
my mom even told me. Sheila and I even wonder, in times that we still do wonder, why our children didn't learn from our mistakes. Trust our word, our wisdom, as we have grown older. And you know what? And someday, I imagine our children will wonder why their children didn't get it, didn't understand. And we have all these generations here that can vouch for this. While the reasons may be it may lie in our own willfulness, we must remember that it may be that it's not yet in God's time for us to understand. God often hides the meaning of what, uh, what we're taught until the time is right and he reveals it. There's a lot of truth in that. In some ways, the disciples in the first century and the disciples in the 21st century, you know what, we're a lot alike. Jesus told them, he's telling us what was going to happen. And it, it did not, or maybe it just hadn't sunk in. I'm not doing anything, guys. Maybe because they or us we're not really ready to learn. Maybe the explanation of why the disciples did not understand is found in scriptures. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, where it says, None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Did you hear that? If the rulers of the Jewish state, Caiaphas, the high priest, members of the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, if they have understood who Jesus truly was, would they have crucified the Lord of glory? This knowledge cannot be grasped by a man of wise discernment or faith except God's message. All who reject his message are foolish no matter how wise the world may think they are. Why did it come to pass? Why did it come to pass? That this truth was so rejected by men of the highest authority who supposedly knew the word of God that they crucified Christ on the cross. Paul answered, because they did not know Christ to save us from our own sins. That the almighty God, full of true majesty, true, uh, full of glory, joined in on manhood. The joining of these two natures in one through Jesus Christ is the proof of, of the divinity, the divinity of Christ. And when the Apostle Paul refers to the sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross, he calls it a mystery in Scripture. And the Greek word mystery, used by Paul in text, it meaning, it means a military strategy that is kept secret from the enemy. You know, oftentimes in ancient military strategy, uh, depended so much upon concealment that even those in high positions in the military uh, who were in command were not told the strategy until the very last minute. Why? So it came out, Paul knew, it came out of Paul. If Satan had known in advance how it was all going to play out, guess what? The plan would have worked. God kept it a mystery. At the cross, while soldiers were driving nails in the hands of Jesus, while Jesus was in grueling pain. His blood was dripping from his body. While Jesus was dying, Satan's thoughts were, you know what, I've won. I've defeated God. But Satan didn't know the entire plan of God. It was three days later when Jesus rose from the tomb that Satan realized the significance of the cross. And he's probably thinking, I played right into God's hands. I did exactly what he expected me to do. I crucified 
Jesus, the Lord of glory. And now, guess what? Sinners, all mankind, can be redeemed and saved from their sin. Jesus told the disciples in advance that a writer was going to come. They didn't get it. They didn't understand. The failure of the disciples to understand the necessity of Jesus' suffering and rejection involves a failure to understand God's plan as announced in Scripture, including God's way of working by using human opposition to fulfill his divine purpose. Do we get it? Do we understand? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. It's the power of God. Do you recall Jesus appearing to the two believers traveling on the road to Emmaus? When their spiritual eyes were finally opened and they realized, you know what, we're talking to Jesus. And he really is alive. He had conquered death. The Bible says this in that passage, their hearts burned within them. With your knowledge of the cross, your faith in Jesus Christ, does your heart burn within? I believe that's what happened to his disciples after the resurrection. Their spiritual eyes were opened. Now all the pieces of the puzzle began to fit together. And these words of Jesus made sense to them. For the first time, they began to understand Jesus' brutal death, his burial, his resurrection. That earlier, seven to ten days earlier, it just went right over their head. Isn't it the same with us? But then the Holy Spirit locks into our hearts and we begin to realize this is a personal message here. You and I confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we become his committed disciples, his followers. What used to be foolishness is now wisdom. What used to be weakness is now power and strength in our life. Suddenly it all makes sense. So I have to ask you this morning, is it making sense in your faith journey? I mean, think of this. Here is is power greater than... It's God's power to change you, to transform you, to make you new. To give you victory over sin and death. Jesus defeated and conquered sin. Our enemy, Satan, on Resurrection Sunday. The victory can now be yours and it can be mine. Understand that. Never let it go. And by reading our text this morning in Luke 18, verses 31 through 34, we may conclude that the disciples were so convinced of their commitment and zeal that they thought ultimate kingdom victory was just a few miles ahead within the next few days in Jerusalem and everything was going to be okay. Or maybe the disciples were examining themselves, positioning themselves in the coming kingdom getting ready for what was about to happen, how we were going to be placed in the kingdom of God rather than following Christ in humility. From the way they speak and later portray Jesus, it's all very clear that their understanding is very superficial. Very superficial. And guess what? It wouldn't endure the the outcome that they would soon witness at the cross. And then all of a sudden, they're left alone. Just wandering. How ready are we for what the Lord has appointed in our lives? 
how ready are we for this? Is our commitment to Christ so sealed that no storm or threat could shake it? We need to commit to living for Christ no matter what. Because of a risen Savior. Because of his work on the cross for my sin, for your sins. Sadly, this Easter day, it, it greets a world that is filled with people who just don't get it. Some have never heard of Jesus. They cannot understand this Resurrection Sunday that we celebrate. Some know the name of Jesus, but only as a part of history. They don't get it. Some just don't get it because they refuse to believe that a man who lived and rose from the dead 2,000 years ago can have an impact on their lives today. Can't understand that. Doesn't make sense to me. Whatever the reason may be, many people just do not understand Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. Our, our world that we live in, they're, they're filled with souls who remain lost. They live in sin, they reject salvation, and they refuse God's offer of forgiveness. Even professing Christians are not committed to Christ. If you don't get it, if, if your Bible remains unread, and if your heart is, is hardened when people speak of Jesus, don't let this day pass without hearing God's offer of eternal life. Maybe you, you failed. Who hasn't? Who hasn't messed up in life? You can have a fresh start today. So we can pick up those broken pieces and, and we can bring them to the Lord and trust in his holy word, the Bible. Even if you don't understand. The Lord, the Lord will put us all back together again and make your life complete. Meaningful. Just lay the broken pieces at the risen Savior's feet. So the question this Resurrection Sunday. Do you understand? Your eternal residence will be decided what you do with the truth you're given concerning Jesus Christ. You're responsible. If this morning you have not fully committed to your heart and your life, your mind to, to following Jesus Christ, please understand this. The death and resurrection of Jesus is real. It's real. Do you really think in, in, in Scripture that these ordinary people, fishermen, followers of Jesus, would have been so bold in speaking the gospel if they had not seen the resurrected Jesus? They were put to death for their faith. And newsflash, there are over 300 people a day around this world put to death because they proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and sharing the gospel message. More people die for their faith today around this world that we live in than the remaining history behind us. You know, we live in a country that if we're willing to work hard, we can enjoy pleasure, or we can enjoy money, acceptance, recognition, position, possessions, and all the recreation we want. And compared to many parts of the world, if not all of it, 
We really do have a good life here in America. But the good life has a way of hiding the truth for a short time in our life. And it's been hiding it well for a long time. Life doesn't work as it was intended if Christ is not in the center of your life. A Christ-centered life is lived by allowing the Holy Spirit to move in you, to live in a way that shows God's grace upon your life. The old you becomes a new you, new direction, new way of thinking. The Christian life has a good testimony for the Lord is that you are a new creation. You're no longer shackled to this world of sin. You're freed by grace and accepts the gift of Jesus Christ from God. Your life can be an example for the truths of Jesus' resurrection by allowing the Holy Spirit to place this, this great gift of salvation in your heart. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. That's a promise. Do we truly understand? Right now, this we can understand. There is only one sacrifice. There is only one way to for forgiveness. There is only one plan of salvation, and it's all made possible through Jesus. Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose that third day for you and for me and all mankind. Do we understand? Your repentance and your faith in Jesus Christ alone for eternal life. Your promise, because of that, your promise, the forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit to empower you to live a life in which we call the Christian life can make it even possible. So may this Resurrection Sunday find your heart saying with, with the Christian world, Christ is risen. He is risen. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for the victory and the power in your name. We thank you that you hold keys over death. Christ was raised from the grave which paves the way for us to live free from bondage. We praise you for your great strength. We praise you for your sacrificial love. We praise you for you, our conqueror, our redeemer. We praise you that you alone are the deliverer, that you're worthy, that you're our everlasting father, our great and awesome God. We confess that we need you. This morning, we ask that you renew our hearts, our minds, our lives. We pray for your Holy Spirit just to refresh us all over again. Keep your words of truth planted firmly within your people. Help us to be, keep focus on what's pure and what's right. May we be the messenger of your word. We have a future, Lord, and our hope is in you. We've been set free. We've been redeemed. The old has lost its grip. And now the new has come through Christ Jesus. And we thank you. Help us to shine our light that you have given us. May we make a difference in the world which you have placed us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
Mm -hmm. Okay. Any hands? We everyone receive? Chris? In Luke chapter 22, the Last Supper, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I'll tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this, and divide it among you. For I'll tell you, I will not drink again and the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Before we take of the bread, Cindy, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Most holy God, as we prepare to take this bread, the symbol of your son's torturously crucified suffering body, we thank you. We thank you because he didn't just endure physical pain. He took on the sins of the world. He was separated from you for the first time ever. God, we give you thanks for this most incredible gift that's hard to put into words. Fully you, but fully human. Christ suffered for us. Think about that as you take this bread, the symbol of his body. Amen. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And before we take partake of the cup, Tom, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, this is Resurrection Sunday, and we thank you for that. But just a few days prior, it was crucifixion. It was crucifixion. You decide, Father, that your life was to be given so that we may live, that we may live with you, Father. You shed your blood on that cross. You took our sins. You took our sins with you, Father, on that cross. Help us, Father, as we take this cup, the, the symbol of the blood shed on that cross. Help us to live the life that you want us to live. Help us to be beacons in our communities worthy of that sacrifice you made for us. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your body. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the same way, after you took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. <laughs> Please stand.
you so much for this beyond word celebration. Lord, I thank you that we know joy, not as the world knows it, but as only you can give. I thank you for the hope of the resurrection. I thank you that we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. I pray for anyone here today, Lord, that doesn't know you as their personal savior, that you would help them to um, just pause and come up here and just pause before you, Lord, and not leave this church until they um, profess you as their Lord and Savior. I pray that you'd be with the rest of our day, Lord, that we would um, just keep you at the center of our, um, our words, our thoughts, our passions. We love you, Lord. We praise you, and we pray this all in Jesus' precious name.